Hi, this is um, Lely Miller Murrow, the Executive Director of the Tahare Justice Center. And um, so I hope this is working. Um, okay, so I think this is starting to work. Um, I'm going to wait until a few more people join, um, but basically what I want to do is help people understand um, what happened last night at the Justice Department. There were some pretty significant things that happened that were historic in nature. Um, also, there's been a lot of public dialogue and rhetoric around these things called sanctuary cities. Um, I want to explain why that's a horrible term to use. It really actually means nothing. Um, I think it's a PR term that's being coined, um, but there is a lot behind it that needs to be understood because, frankly, the dialogue around sanctuary cities is simply going to create um, cities that are unsafe for all of us to live in. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and then finally, something very significant literally just happened today from Canada um, that may cause them to open up their borders to our refugees, which is very interesting um, and very historic as well. So there's a lot that's happening all the time in the United States. It's a rather interesting time to be a lawyer, but it's all very, very confusing, I think, to the public who's trying to understand what is going on. So, um, okay, before diving into those three topics, there's some behind the scenes things happen that have happened recently that have not been in the press and are not public that I want to share with you all. Um, as you know, the Tahare Justice Center provides free legal services to immigrant women and girls, and we do that through our offices in the Washington DC area, in Houston, Texas, in San Francisco, and in Baltimore. Um, we also have an amazing public policy advocacy staff that advocate on the Hill to make systemic or structural and legal policy changes. And so we're getting a lot of data from the field and we have a lot of information and intelligence that's coming at us from all directions, much of which is not getting in the press. Um, so we've just heard that prosecutorial discretion has just been taken away from all immigration um, attorneys. Now, what that means essentially is that immigration attorneys uh, working for the government, that is, whose job it is to argue the government's side on immigration cases. They may be arguing for the deportation of somebody. Attorneys like us at the Tahari Justice Center may then be arguing that somebody is eligible for immigration relief as a human trafficking victim. There's specific pieces for human tra trafficking victims as an asylum seeker because they face persecution. There are many forms of legal relief that may be possible to someone who is suffering violence and abuse. Prosecutorial discretion allows for um, U.S. government immigration attorneys to walk into court and to be reasonable, to look at the record, to look at the evidence, and then to say, you know, I don't want to waste judicial resources. I don't want to waste your time. Here are the issues that I'm willing to concede on. Here are the issues that I have a real problem with. And then you do battle in the courtroom based on a whittled down understanding of what is really in controversy, what is really at issue. What's happened now is that the government attorneys are essentially going to have to always argue all issues in all cases rather than using their judgment and concede points where it's absolutely reasonable to concede those points. So this is really going to make the, fish, uh, the system far less efficient and even more backlogged than it already is. Um, another thing that just happened that we've heard about is that um, all of the courts and asylum officers have just received an internal memorandum from the Justice Department telling them to not make final adjudication decisions in asylum cases from the seven countries that have now been barred for 90 days from coming to the United States. And you'll remember these are seven countries, none of which had any role in the September 11th attacks. 
And none of the people from these seven countries have ever been implicated in any terrorist activity in the United States. But those are the seven countries that are now being um, temporarily banned from coming to the United States. And by the way, the executive order, although ostensibly it has a 90 day time frame, um, within 60 days, the president has asked the attorney general in consultation with the State Department to recommend additional countries for banning. So it's very clear in the language of the order that this is not necessarily the end, although there was an initial 90 day period. Um, that applied to people who were outside the country coming in. What is happening today is that it, it looks like people who are seeking asylum in the United States. So this, the difference between asylum and refugee status is someone outside the country trying to come in, a refugee because they're being persecuted, versus somebody who's already in the country trying to stay applying for asylum. So the scenario of an asylum seeker may involve um, somebody who came on a student visa, they're studying at Harvard. And uh, while they're here, their country has a revolution and they cannot go home. Their whole family was murdered by the ruling power. Their own political opinion now makes it very dangerous. They would likely be arrested and tortured if they returned. They then apply for asylum in the United States. So these are people who are here already. Um, they came in various ways who are applying for asylum. The asylum judicial backlog right now is multiple, multiple years to have your first trial. So not even including appeals, you may not get your first trial. You're hearing before the immigration judge and sorry, until 2021 or 2020, extremely severe. And, um, and this is just going to make it worse because it's going to delay final adjudication in those cases, again, of people who are already in the United States as asylum seekers. Um, so um, somebody just asked, which ones are the terrorists, asylum seekers or refugees? Um, the answer is very clearly neither both asylum seekers and refugees are the victims of terrorists. Those are people who are fleeing persecution. Refugees are simply fleeing persecution from outside the country. And asylum seekers are seeking protection um, after already having arrived in the country. The legal process to grant someone legal status as a refugee or as an asylum seeker is already the most stringent in the world. There is no more country that has more stringent requirements and they were all implemented after September 11th. We have a 99% denial rate for refugees applying for refugee status in the United States. So it's really hard to get asylum or refugee status. Um, you have to obviously prove that you're not a terrorist. We have a gazillion security metric biometrics. You have to give your blood. You have to do um, fingerprint testing. There's information that has to come from your host country from the CIA database, the FBI database, um, the State Department. It's, 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 there are incredible levels of security that are already in place. And then on top of that, you have to prove that you're legally qualified for asylum or refugee status, and the legal bar is extremely high. Your life has to be in danger. There has to be evidence that you're facing persecution. And it's not sufficient to be facing persecution. You have to, in fact, prove that your persecution is because of your race, your religion, or your nationality, political opinion, or social group. Um, and as I mentioned before, there has been not one, that's zero, not one terrorist attack by refugees or asylum seekers in the United States, not one. So the person who asked which of the hijackers were asylum or refugees, the answer is zero. None of them were. So that's why all of this is not really making us safer. Um, so, okay, the three topics that I promised to talk about. Um, what happened last night at the Justice Department? So this was very interesting. Um, you may have heard that Trump fired the attorney general last night. And let me explain a little bit about what transpired. So Sally Yates, is um, uh, was the deputy attorney general under the Obama administration. And when Loretta Lynch, who was his attorney general, left her position, as is common, um, when the Obama administration ended, uh, Trump asked 
if she would stay on and serve as the acting attorney general until the attorney general that he wanted, Senator Jeff Sessions, could be uh, approved. So she was there at his behest. Now, it is the job of the attorney general to disagree with the president. It's their job. Their job is to tell the president no. It's very similar to like the general counsel of a major corporation. They're always telling the CEO they can't do what they think they can do. They're like the limits on the boss, essentially. And so it is normal. It is expected. And in fact, there's a great um, video of Jeff Sessions' personal interview of um, Sally Yates during the confirmation process where he grills her on this exact point, um, getting her to promise that she won't just agree with the president and that she will in fact push back. And so that's what she did. And it was exactly within her legal right to do that. In fact, that is her job. Um, the way she did it though was arguably unusual. So what essentially happened is that um, President Trump issued these uh, executive orders, many of them, um, the ones that relate to immigration and refugees are three executive orders. He issued those executive orders and then what happened was at least 14 lawsuits were filed by organizations um, like the Tahare Justice Center who represent people who were victims of these orders, legitimate refugees, legitimate um, people coming to this country on various visas from those countries who are trying to reunite with their families, who deserve to be here, who have a le legal right to be here. Um, the ones you've probably heard about are from the ACLU. So they brought these lawsuits. The Justice Department is the government's, are the, they are the government's attorneys. So their job in the context of these lawsuits would then be to defend the lawsuits on behalf of President Trump. So it's the public's job uh, and nonprofit organizations and other law firms have all mobilized to sue the government and say these orders are unconstitutional. And then it's in turn the government's job to defend those lawsuits and say they are constitutional and then there's a legal process that would determine its constitutionality or whether they could go forward. What happened in this case was the attorney general herself stood up and said, I will not defend these lawsuits. As a matter of moral conscience, I believe that these are unconstitutional and I'm not even gonna ask the attorneys to defend these lawsuits. It was well within her right to do that. What was unusual about the way she did it is she did it without parsing and, and, and articulating a legal analysis around each provision of the executive orders. Now, I've read all the executive orders and we've digested them in, in kind of minutia detail. And in fairness, they're part of the executive orders that are fully within his legal right. There are other parts that are clearly unconstitutional. Um, I think there's a lot about the executive orders that will fail in court, um, but there may have been other aspects of them that would have held up. And rather than parsing that, she just said, I'm not defending these lawsuits. So he fired her um, by, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, and then brought in um, somebody else um, who, who he likes better, uh, Dana Buente. So that's what happened, and that's um, how that system works around that. Um, some of the pundits have been saying that this hasn't happened like this since President Nixon. Um, okay, so that's what happened at the Justice Department. I think, um, let me say something about staffing and management really quickly, because what is happening behind the scenes that is not being shown in the media, but we're experiencing, um, and many of our friends who are inside the government are, are really, really frustrated about is frankly the lack of leadership and management within these agencies. Um, and there are other really significant consequences. There's a lot of, we don't know who's in charge and who's in fact setting policy. That has in part to do with the lack of consultation before unveiling these policies with agencies. Um, now what's happened with President uh, Trump having fired Sally Yates is that there is now nobody in the Justice Department who can sign off on wiretaps. So under um, law, in order to wiretap a suspected terrorist, you have to have the signature of a politically appointed high-ranking person in the Justice Department. She was the last remaining person who fell into that category. And so now that she has been fired, there's nobody at the Justice Department who can sign off on wiretaps. That makes the country less safe because if the FBI, if the CIA suspects 
that somebody is a terrorist and they want to tap their phones in order to gather evidence um, and, and to watch the situation, uh, now they cannot do that because there's nobody in place to sign off on the wiretaps. Okay, so Canada, what is Canada doing? Today, um, Canada announced that it is considering um, revoking a convention agreement that it has with the United States that prevents asylum seekers from basically forum shopping. It prevents them from being able to go from country to country. So essentially, um, since 2004, the United States and Canada have had this treaty. It's called the Canada-United States Safe Third Party Country Agreement. And what it does is it means that if you come to the United States, um, let's say you are a Christian from Sudan and you're fleeing the um, northern violence against Christians in Sudan. You may have heard of that situation. It's, it's as, absolutely horrific. People are being mass executed. Entire families are killed very indiscriminately. Um, there's horrible violence going on right now. So if you have fled that situation and come to the United States and you landed here, let's say you stayed for a few weeks, maybe you even went to school here, you cannot then go to Canada and apply for asylum because this agreement basically says, you know what, you were in the United States, you really should have applied here. And implicit underneath that agreement is a mutual respect between Canada and the United States for our judicial systems. So Canada is essentially saying, you know, the United States would have given you asylum if you deserved asylum. And, um, and you know, the United States vice versa is saying Canada would have given you asylum. We trust them. We trust their judiciary. And so you can't go there and then come here asking for asylum. And, and you can't come to the United States and then go to Canada asking for asylum. Um, and you can see where this would really play out, particularly if someone has, in fact, applied for asylum. And let's say the Canadian court system heard their case, saw all of the evidence and said, you're not you don't qualify for asylum. You have not been persecuted in the way that the law requires. You haven't been able to prove that your persecution is because of your race, your nationality, your political opinion, religion, or membership in a social group. So you got to go home. We're not giving you asylum. That person then can't come across the border at a land port of entry to the United States and try to apply for asylum. The United States will then say, mm, sorry, you applied in Canada and we trust the Canadian judiciary, so we're not going to grant you asylum. So we have this agreement that's kind of a mutual agreement. Implicit in it is a mutual trust of the judicial process of our countries that prevents people from going from country to country to try to get protection. Canada is, re is considering today revoking that agreement. And so essentially what they're saying is we're not sure we trust the United States judicial process anymore. And we're willing to let people who have even applied for asylum in the United States and lost, or people who've entered in the United States and then come to our country seeking asylum, um, we're gonna allow them to do that because we think they may in fact need protection even if they've come through the United States. This is really amazing because it may result in mass immigration influx to Canada by our 11 million undocumented who have asylum claims, um, also by people in the United States currently who have applied for asylum, who have been denied or who are already in our system. Um, and so it's it's a huge like. I don't want to say sacrifice, but it's a huge deal for Canada to be willing to absorb those kinds of numbers. So this hasn't happened yet, by the way. This is all hypothetical, but they are considering revoking um, this convention. Okay, so the last topic um, is this question of sanctuary cities. You may have seen sanctuary cities um, being talked about in the press. And that's a horrible phrase to use. It really means nothing legally. Um, and I think it's a phrase that somebody in a PR conference room probably um, decided to use. So what they're really talking about is the fact, okay, so the United States Constitution, as it was written a long, long, long time ago, has a provision in it that essentially says to states, we, the federal government, are not going to make you do stuff. 
So essentially, the Constitution, this was, this was written as a way to protect states from having to carry out federal business, from having to kind of carry out dirty work of the federal government. And so the U.S. Constitution says that the federal government cannot force local states to implement or uh, enforce certain federal laws. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's a simplistic version of it. So as a way to make local governments do things, the government can dangle federal funding and basically put conditions on it, or it can threaten the revocation of federal funding. But it has to be careful about that because it can't be used as a, a way to subvert the Constitution. And it's been gray for a long time. And this was a mechanism employed by the Obama administration as well and by the Bush administration. So this is not unique to the Trump administration um, using federal funding and the threat of revoking it as a way to get local governments to do things. Um, and so what the immigration um, office has wanted local governments to do is have local police act as immigration agents. So local police in a local town need to be accessible to its residents in order to keep it safe. They need everybody in that community to feel like they can dial 911 and to feel like police will then come and protect them. The problem is if police are doubling as INS agents, people from the immigrant community will not dial 911 because although they want to be um, protected from violence, they don't want to be deported and they don't want their father to be deported and they don't want their child to be deported. And even though they may in fact be legal, they may have documents, they don't want friends, families and neighbors to be vulnerable. So there's a danger and, and chiefs of police all over the country have been speaking out in press conferences against Trump's increased and kind of ramped up pressure, which is in these executive orders to get local police to act as immigration agents and turn people over to ICE. Also, what's really significant about these executive orders is they're not simply asking or demanding that local police turn over criminals. You see, and that, would, that, and that has happened in the past. Obama did that and Bush did that. And the idea behind that is, look, if you've got a convicted criminal when you release them from county jail, don't just release them back out, send them to ICE and we'll deport them. That's what the previous administrations have always asked for. What's different now because of these executive orders is that the executive order is not just about criminals, it's like about everybody. So the very specific language, and this is in the Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States Executive Order, which was signed on January 25th. It calls for the priority deportation of not convicted criminals. Now, the campaign rhetoric was about convicted criminals, but this isn't what he's done. It has a very broad range articulation that will impact all 11 million who are undocumented in the United States, even those who are victims of crime, even those who are witnesses of crime, even those who have legal remedies available to them that could help them be legal that they're entitled to, they just don't understand their legal rights. So the broad subjective categories include, quote, those who've been charged with any criminal offense. So not just convicted, but charged. That's really bad for our clients, and I'll explain why. So the Tahereh Justice Center represents, among others, immigrant women and girls who are domestic violence victims. So we had a client, for example, who was married to a U.S. citizen for 15 years. She married to, I don't know where he was from, like Ohio or something, but he was a U.S. citizen completely. And she had three children. She had been living in the United States for 15 years. As you probably know, when you're married to a U.S. citizen, you are entitled to a green card because you're married to a U.S. citizen. And after a few years of being on that green card, you can apply for U.S. citizenship. She should have become a U.S. citizen a very, very long time ago, but he was abusive. And as a further tool of abuse and control, he refused to petition for his legal status. And it requires him to do it under the law. And so he kept her undocumented as a way to control her and as a way to further abuse her. He was a U.S. citizen, all her children are U.S. citizens. She's lived in the country for 15 years. She had the legal right to be a U.S. citizen, but he kept her undocumented as a further tool of abuse. They had an altercation and he tried to strangle her. In defense, she bit him. 
She bit his hand as a way to defend herself. The police come to the home. They charge him with assault and they charge her with assault because she bit him and they could see the bite marks. And until that's adjudicated, uh, most police would bring a, uh, they would go ahead and file charges around assault for both of them. Now, of course, in her case, once the case was adjudicated, the court found her to be innocent, but she was charged. And so according to this executive order, the prioritization around deportation would include people who've simply been charged, even though, like her, she should be a U.S. citizen. She has a legal remedy available to her. She should be documented, and she is not a danger to the United States. She would be swept up under this order for deportation without giving a chance um, to apply for legal status that she's entitled to, and even though she's in fact a victim of crime. Um, another thing that the executive order has, so it has people who've been charged with any criminal offense. Also, it says those who have committed acts that constitute a chargeable criminal offense. So it's not just having convic been convicted of a crime, it's having been charged of a crime, not only just that, but having done something that could have constituted a chargeable crime. And then the real kicker is the last one, which says, or those who in the judgment of any immigration officer otherwise pose a risk to public safety. So this is like everybody. I mean, an immigration officer can walk down the street, look at you and say, you look to me like you pose a risk to public safety and they under this order would be swept up. So while the fact that the federal government is asking local police to collaborate in immigration enforcement itself is not new, what is new? is the scope of that. It's not just convicted criminals. It's people who've been charged with a crime, people who may have done something that could result in a charge of a crime, or people who just in the judgment of any immigration officer pose a risk um, to public safety. So the, the broad nature of this executive order will create mass fear among all 11, uh, 11 million undocumented in the United States. And we are already um, receiving phone calls. I've personally received an inquiry from somebody who is really afraid to just call the police. And people are afraid, people who are documented, people who have green cards, people who are here completely legally are very afraid right now, given all that's happening happening of calling um, the police. Now that makes us all unsafe. This affects me, it affects you. You do not need to be an immigrant in order to be affected by this because our communities are less safe when witnesses aren't willing to step forward, when victims aren't willing to report, when people go underground. And many police understand that. Um, and that's why many of them have been against this kind of imposition of collaboration with immigration um, and why they're really reacting strongly to the current executive order. Okay, so I think that about covers it. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think I've covered the three topics that I promised to cover. Um, I have seen a lot of questions in the comments and I have just not been able to address them because they're coming so quickly. I'll go back and try to answer them in the comment section itself. And of course, um, we'll post the recording of this. Thanks for joining and I'll make an effort to um, do more of this to update as legal issues are arising in the United States that are very complicated that the Tahereh Justice Center and its staff deal with every day. Thanks so much.